It's Juneteenth, y'all. The 156th anniversary of the day when Union troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to ensure that all enslaved people be freed. Now, this day came a whole two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared more than three million slaves be free. And while three million people seems like a lot, there were still about 250,000 more black souls and black lives needing liberation in Texas. So what happened in those two and a half years before news reached Galveston? Well, y'all know the saying, if a tree falls and no one's around, does it make a sound? And that's what happened. Trees fell, and it was all silence because enslavers withheld information for two and a half full years. Black folks were still treated as animals, as property, and simply put, not as human. So branch by branch, leaf after leaf, twig upon twig, trees fell for two and a half years, but no damn sound of freedom. Fannie Lou Hamer said it best, nobody's free until everybody's free. And when news finally reached Galveston, former enslaved folks celebrated with prayer, feast, song, and dance. Which is why the following year, observances officially began, some calling it Jubilee Day. And along that same energy, more prayer, more spirituals, and even some new clothes, you know how we do, <laughs> to represent freedom. In 1979, Texas became the first state to make Juneteenth an official holiday. And you probably saw earlier this week, the Senate unanimously approved Juneteenth National Independence Day Act to make Juneteenth a national holiday. And a day later, the bill passed the U.S. House of Representatives. And on Thursday, President Joe Biden officially signed it into law. Now, making Juneteenth a national holiday is vital because many folks still don't know the history and a national holiday gives a bigger platform to re-educate and rejoice. And while we celebrate today, it's hard not to notice how the delay faced in Galveston still reverberates in many ways. Because systematically, we ask, how free are we in 2021? What about economic freedom? Freedom at the ballot box? Freedom to pursue employment without being discriminated against by the color of our skin? How about freedom to see a doctor as our basic human right? Freedom to obtain a home loan without racial bias? Or how about when we see all too often? Freedom to leave our very houses and return alive before being brutalized or killed by law enforcement. See y'all, Galveston, it's actually become America in so many ways today. And it's time finally to liberate our people fully. So today as we celebrate and we mutually commemorate, we now have to ask, what does Juneteenth mean to you? Juneteenth means the end of slavery as a law. It means something to me, at least to be able to take a pause for a second and just remember our ancestors, which is what I hope that we'll end up doing on the day. Uh, personally, I think that uh, Juneteenth is a win for the black community, uh, but I also believe that we have a ways to go. Our people lost land for what uh, Juneteenth is about. They lost their lives, they lost family members, they lost history. Yeah, we hide history sometimes, so we had brothers and sisters that even after we were freed, didn't know we were free. Juneteenth about to be a holiday, but as far as black excellence, we rising to the top. It's so needed. And Usher was a really big part of making that happen. He's in Washington, D.C. right now. Today, we are celebrating Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day. <laughs> Eat together, Fresh. love one another. Love, love on each other. Have a happy, happy Juneteenth, y'all. <laughs> happy Juneteenth. Not only is it a, it a growing, it's a growing time, but we need to start sharing more information amongst each other. What's up, y'all? Can y'all hear me? I said, what's up, y'all? Don't act like y'all don't see this money green. <laughs> I see you playing with the money green. All right, listen. Y'all, good evening, and welcome to Revolt and Vices, Juneteenth special, coming from the gathering spot in Atlanta. Round of applause for the gathering spot. Supported, of course, by J.P. Morgan Chase. 
Y'all listen, we are with a live audience coming out of this pandemic. Can we get a round of applause for that? We appreciate all y'all for y'all's COVID tests and vaccinations. All right, y'all, listen, we're very excited for what's in store tonight. All sorts of guests, y'all. We have panels, we have musical guests, spoken words, and overall, we're gonna show up and put out for the culture. Helping me do it this evening, Vice's own, shout out to Bro Dexter Thomas. And I could never do this by myself. We have Revolt's own, Rodney Rakai. Listen, y'all, it's a lot of emotions going on with this weekend, right, of Juneteenth and this federal holiday being observed and the simultaneous work that's required to get the reparations and everything else that we so deserve. Here's the thing, though. We're going to rejoice this freedom, but we can't ignore this. The many ways in which our freedom is still being obstructed, oppressed by this America that we live in, so-called a democracy. Because what I'm referring to is our freedom at the ballot box. Yes, I want to start things off with a discussion about voter suppression. I know Georgia knows it well. Listen, black folks cannot and will not be suppressed at the ballot box, and what we won't do is suppress our own vote. So joining me now by video is rapper and activist, Trey the Truth. Brother Trey, we're going to get to voting in a minute. I want to thank you for joining me, and I want to thank you uh, the recent hurricane and devastation of natural disaster, the Houston and the Texas area lived through, you were vital in coming through for the culture around that. I know I personally donated to your organization and I wanna thank you for being one of the few orgs, y'all. This is, this is what you should know about Try the Truth. When you give to this brother and his org, it goes straight to the people. I appreciate that, appreciate you for having me. Absolutely. Trey, I want to ask you this. Uh, one of the things that you do that I so revere is that you make sure that in your efforts to make sure that black folks are empowered at the ballot, it includes black folks who have been formerly incarcerated and have felonies previously on their record. And I know it's personal to you, Trey, because you yourself at a time thought that you were ineligible to vote because you were a former felon. Talk a little bit about how you realize you indeed are able to vote in this country's elections and what that means to you. Um, I think it's more so, man, it's very important for us just to have the knowledge. I actually, just within the last maybe two years, just found out that felons were able to vote. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you know, you know, I'm probably the only artist out of Texas that they allow to tour through the prisons mm -hmm. and do different things, man. And I'm one of the ones that I feel like if it's something that I find out and I can speak up, I'm going to stand on the front line for it. And a lot of felons didn't know that they can vote. And without them knowing that, you know, it's strength in numbers, you know, so people feel like, hey, if we disable the people or if we get them the lack of that knowledge, then we can dictate which way this may go or which way the situations may end up. So after finding that out, um, and actually it's not just felons who, it's just felons who's not, um, I, actually even on, on cases. It's even ways that the people who are still dealing with cases can also vote too. And I think it showed this last go round because the numbers, when it came to voting with Biden and everything else, the numbers were probably at an all time high, man. And it's, it's, it's important for us to, to be able to be in position because they try and strip us of that, whether it's just through the knowledge or, or anything thereof. And it, it just put us in a situation where we kind of get frustrated and tap out and say effort. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's, that's the majority of what we really go through, man. Our vote don't count when people don't really understand the reason our vote don't count because it's not necessarily enough of us and we have to vote for things that count. If people in position, that's more vital than us voting for a president, that people don't even know that. So that's we got to spread that knowledge. That part right there, Trey, uh, the presidential election's important. You know what else is? District attorney. You know what else is? Mm -hmm. Mayor, school board. We could be here all day. Um, I think that's so important too that you speak, Trey, about how so many folks don't know their eligibility. There are people that are currently still on probation, but depending on what your underlying conviction is, and I speak as a former public defender and a former uh, criminal defense attorney, 
there are a lot of us that are eligible to have our voices heard, have our, our American citizenship honored at the ballot, and we don't know it. And Trey, what you're doing to make sure that other folks know, like you now know, is very important. Now, as you registered other felons, ex-felons, I'll say, to vote, uh, walk us through what your messaging is like, Trey. What do, you, what do you say to these individuals to get them, as you say, motivated to think about the collective power of the vote? Because here's what we know, and this is true because I, I say this in the state of Georgia. Many folks felt their vote didn't count, but what I know for sure is Senator Warnock, Senator Ossoff, is possible because we voted. We voted. So Trey, talk a little bit about the importance of getting uh, formerly convicted felons out to the polls and what you tell them to be motivated that their vote does count. Let me clarify this. So even with my cases, I wasn't necessarily, I ended up beating my cases. So I ne I've never had the felon actually on my record, but you know, I've just been frontline for it. Mm -hmm. But what happens is you come home and you, you don't really have options. You know what I'm saying? They strip you of everything. Well, you, you can't even really get an apartment these days being a felon. You can't do anything. And I think, man, it's just designed for, for to discourage them. But the thing that I tell them is just being transparent. Like, hey, you know, coming from where we come from in the streets, you know, we need to dictate the narrative of what we got going on. If you're coming home and they consistently putting you in situations where you can't get a job, you can't take care of your family, then you're forced to do what we know best, which is hustle, and then they send you right back there. Okay, they made that that blueprint for you to keep getting through back in the system. So let's get people in position who may understand y'all's side of the story, who may understand that y'all deserve a second chance, or may understand that we have to change some of these laws in place where y'all can go get a job and have a second chance, or you can take care of your kids, or you can um, vote or do certain things. It's a lot of things felons can't do. And it's only because people in position just feel like they ain't worthy or feel like what they got going on don't matter because they may have made a mistake in the past. Indeed. Now, we know uh, hip hop and, and MCs like yourself, Trey, have not always necessarily been so gung-ho on voting and this aspect of our democracy. What makes you feel empowered to stand out and, and maybe disrupt a little bit of that narrative that says hip hop and voting do indeed go together? Uh, I just feel like we've been getting the bad end of the stick. And, and I was a part of that situation where I was getting the bad end of the stick. And, you know, I, I got to a point where as years went by, I was like, man, oh, well, we just used to it. We settled for it. Mm -hmm. Then I got to a point where, you know, I just kind of got a little rebellious. Like, nah, I ain't going to settle for that. Like, you're not going to tell me what I can and can't do or, or or limit me to how far I can go or, or what things can be done. And um, I decided to just change it around, man. And for me, it's fun when you disrupt stuff. Like, like for instance, you know, fighting for Breonna Taylor. You know, I had moved to... Um, Kentucky with Until Freedom fighting for her. And I was a real pain for Daniel Cameron. You know, we was at you look like man you had me that Jerry Yeah. Times. Huh? I said you look like yeah, you enjoy yeah, being a pain in Daniel Cameron's times. ass. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's like sometimes you have to do that, man, because it goes to show, okay, y'all was comfortable, you know what I'm saying? And the people in position are, are real comfortable. The worst thing you can do is make them uncomfortable. Yep. So now it's time it's uncomfortable we as the people been for a long time and just those in the community. We've been uncomfortable our whole lives, so now it's time to make them uncomfortable. So now they're going to have to get their stuff together. Like, I ain't going to make it easy for them. I'm not one who's going to be able to push the roll away. Oh, like, I'm going to fight full fledged. I'm just, I'm against going against the things that they say we can't do. Right. And, and stepping up to the ones that people feel. Trey, yeah. I totally agree well, with you. Got no fear. Yeah, listen, we're not here to make uh, the oppressor comfortable. We're here to do what we need to do to liberate our people. So I want to look at some recent legislation in your home state of Texas, where a recent bill includes mm -hmm. provisions that literally limit the hours of early voting. And we know black folks, us, we disproportionately vote early. It also curtails other voting rights options, like voting for mail, which we also disproportionately do. And then we, there's right here in Georgia. And y'all already know what they did here in Georgia. They made it almost illegal to prevent, not almost, it, it is. It is prevented for voters to get food and water while they wait in line to cast their noble ballot. Uh, we know this is voter suppression, but we also know this is out white, look at that 40 years left, outright white supremacy. 
Trey, what do you think about these new, uh, I know, right? You got to laugh at that. What do you think about these new very overt efforts to, to silence the black vote? And how important does that tell you our black vote is? So what happens is um, they do these type of things because, again, we make them uncomfortable. And it's like, okay, well, since you're doing this to us, we're going to strip you of this. And, and if you move to do this to us, then we're going to strip you of this. So what we did, me and um, Until Freedom, we got with Vogue Vote. When it was time for the campaign, mm -hmm. we jumped on a tour bus and we went to almost every city you could think of. And as they had these people in lines with no food, no water, we went and took them everything. We went and, and, and had music out there and did everything to make people feel comfortable. Right. Because one thing they fear is us uniting and us standing for something. Because again, it strengthened our numbers. We show up and show out when it's time. And as you can see, not only does the black vote, not only does the youth vote, all that stuff shows them what we're capable of this last go round. So now they know the power that we uphold. Um, but they, they forever try and strip us of things like that. And that's why we find ways to go around it. Like right now, I'm not sure if you're familiar, I really don't, I can give two you know what's about the, the governor we got. Like oh, he, he just passed a law where, yeah. where he signed a pass a law where kids are not allowed to learn about um, critical race theory. Yeah, racism mm -hmm. and you know and, and stuff in the past. And it's like, why why would you why would you strip people of that? Like it's like you're trying to sweep that under the rug. And I feel mm -hmm. like doing it because they ain't affected. It's not affecting them directly. The only time it really affected people like that was when it happened at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that that made them understand. Okay, this could be us too. But um. It's like they just constantly trying to strip us of everything. So I'm doing everything in my power to let them know we ain't gonna give them that. It's not. It's just not gonna be an easy go. Like yeah. I'm not. As far as even with the protesters, you got peaceful protesters. Like they taking their rights from them too. Yep. Here's the thing, Trey. Uh, you said it best. We're not going back, y'all. We're not going back. So Trey, from some final words from you. Are there organizations, are there agents of change, activists out there that you want our audience to be aware of so they can follow their lead and get more information about how to make sure that we continue to fight for our collective liberation as a people? You know, it's so crazy. And I had a conversation the other day. It's no, some people think it's just organizations, mm -hmm. which it is some, you know, you have Woke Vote, which, which works hard daily to do their thing until freedom, which is, you know, me, Tamika Mallory, my son, yep. Angelo Pinto, Linda. But then you have a lot of the youngsters and, and youth that's just in these different cities and neighborhoods that don't get the recognition, that don't have organizations that do just much fighting for us and just as much um, putting things in, in the aspect to get the people together to, to just do the things that need to be done as a whole. So I don't think it's necessarily one organization. I think just people that if you come across their page or somebody shoot somebody your direction just take a chance to pay attention to them because you is like even me i learned i mean yeah. i didn't when i put that march together um in houston with bun that was over eighty thousand people I, I ain't never did that before i ain't have no idea but you that's, had by some, the way that's how i came across you with trey. Me making sure i was getting it done trey that's I, how i came across you bun b conversation i was having with bun b is how i recognize the work that you and your organization do yeah, shout out to Bun. So I think, man, just recognizing everybody. You know, you, you got my little brother Herb on here. Everybody, you know, doing their part. Like, I, I salute him. You know, even, you know how in the past, you know, people didn't need to take mental Ill illness serious. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got a son who's disabled. You know, people don't, you have a, a, a lot of different situations, a lot of people that step up and show different things and shed light. And all that stuff had to be commended. And, you know, you have to salute them because, it was a point in time, man, in all these aspects, people were quiet and silent and scared. But you got people like myself and others that that's doing the work that needs to be done. We love and appreciate everything you've been doing, specifically to keep the voters in Texas engaged uh, and activated. So Trey, the truth, brother, we thank you so much. Now listen, when we talk about people I being engaged, you. absolutely, thank you. All right, y'all, right, right, peace Trey. Now listen, y'all, when we talk about folks being engaged and keeping the activated voter base in check, particularly when it comes here to Georgia, there's no other name that comes to mind first 
his sister, Stacey Abrams. That's right. Stacey's the founder of the Fair Fight Action. She's the queen of all things fighting voter suppression. And we're blessed and we're thrilled to the fact that Stacey has joined us by video with a word. Thank you, Stacey. I'm excited to join Revolt TV in commemorating Juneteenth, a day of celebration and freedom for African Americans. This day is one to reflect on the strength, perseverance, and fortitude of our community. For centuries, Black people have spoken truth to power and fought to push our nation to live up to its highest ideals. Despite the struggle, we have found collective joy and methods of celebration for our storied past and our bright future. On this Juneteenth, let's remember the power we hold individually and collectively. Despite numerous attempts to silence our voices and render us hopeless, we have shown time and time again that we will lift our voices and work our hands to fight against injustice. Let that spirit continue to guide us as we fight to create the future we all deserve. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, y'all. <laughs> Queen Stacy, sister, we thank you again for your tireless work to combat voter suppression and keeping us at the polls. We appreciate you. All right, y'all, let's keep this energy going. We've got a recording artist, and he's gonna bring us a spoken word. Y'all know him well. Here's Tristan Mack Wilds with a poem entitled, The Sun Kissed Me. Who is the colored man? Is he a king? Ruler of empires and gold, a conqueror and holder of God's knowledge? Was he a slave? Forced laborer of lands he didn't know, couldn't own. Given a new history, void of his own tongue. Either way, our ancestors endured centuries of being property, merely holding on to a dream of us having more than they could fathom. They wanted us to live amongst the stars they charted for us. So why have we settled for the dim light of the moon, not bask in the sun? But if you pay attention, if you listen real close, at the beginning of every sunrise, you can still hear the spirit of our ancestors sing. Thoughts of a colored man, October 1st. Happy Juneteenth, y'all. Happy Juneteenth, y'all. Powerful words from Brother Tristan. What's going on, y'all? Hey, hey. So welcome back, everyone, to Revolt and Vice's Juneteenth special right here from the gathering spot in Atlanta. My name is Dexter Thomas from Vice News. So now, Juneteenth is all about us celebrating our freedom. But freedom at the ballot box is one enormous hurdle that our people have faced throughout history, and it still persists today. Let's take a look. This bill will establish a simple, uniform standard, which cannot be used, however ingenious, the effort to flout our Constitution. A lot of people expected the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to do what it promised, to protect the voting rights of everyone. Polling places were swapped by both Negro and white voters. But after history was made in 2008, and again in 2012, that promise became less of a guarantee. In 2013, the Supreme Court declared parts of the act unconstitutional and allowed local governments to change voting laws without federal permission. And right before the 2016 election, this happened. We're not gonna lose. The only way we can lose, in my opinion, I really mean this, Pennsylvania, is if cheating goes on. Trump ended up losing the popular vote. But of course, that didn't matter. There was no evidence of voter fraud. But that didn't stop Trump from claiming that there was, or his base from believing him. Which all leads us to this point. Despite the pandemic, Biden supporters voted in historic numbers. 
flipping red states blue. And now, lawmakers in 48 states are introducing bills that would make it harder to vote. But just like in the 2020 election, in this fight over voter rights, all eyes are on the South once again, particularly Texas, where the state legislature is considering a long list of new restrictions, including banning ballot drop boxes and drive through voting centers, prohibiting after hours voting, limiting early Sunday voting, and making absentee ballots harder to obtain. And if anyone doesn't follow these strict rules, they could be forced to pay fines or face other penalties. So my determination in fighting voter suppression definitely stems from understanding my history. My name is Jasmine Crockett. I am the state representative for House District 100. When I'm not acting as the state rep, I'm usually working as a criminal defense and civil rights attorney. Does somebody have to die before we get rid of a bad officer? That should not be the standard, and that is the problem. I am the only uh, black freshman in the Texas House. I am only the 22nd black woman to be elected to the Texas House. I am the youngest elected official in the state of Texas. Yes, yes, that's me. I came here to legislate. It just so happens that I'm black. In the state of Texas, we have more African Americans than any other state, and we're continuing to grow that population. And I think that that's yet another reason that voices like mine needed to be here writing the laws. And instead of us doing something to protect people in this state, we decide to punish punish people who are already suffering. That is what's wrong in this house. Voting gives us our voice. In 2020, we saw a record number of voters. The reality is that the numbers were so tight this last time, it was somewhere between five and six points in this state. But the majority of this state is black and brown. What does that mean? We know that the majority of black and brown people vote democratically. The Republican Party is shifting in the wrong direction. They are trying to turn our government into anything but a democracy. And that is a problem. Democracy is only good so long as they retain power. Once they lose their power, then they want to get rid of democracy and do something different. And it's, it's sad. I thought that once we ridded ourselves of the cancer known as Trump, we would be OK but we're not. He still lingers in the hallways of so many of these legislative bodies, including the hallways here in the state of Texas. 48 states are trying to enact laws that will suppress the vote. And what that means is that we've got to fight back even harder. SB 7 here in the state of Texas, in my opinion, it was a life-threatening bill. So since we walked out of the chamber on SB 7, what I've seen is number one, the bill died. And that was a huge win for us. Number two, there is a shift in the attitude of the Republicans. They don't really know what we're willing to do, how far we're willing to go. They don't know if we will continue to break quorum. And so therefore, they will have to enter into good faith negotiations if there's going to be a new voter bill this session. Democrats on a national scale have to work together. We've got to apply pressure to the US Senate and send them a message. If you don't pass what we need to back us up, then maybe we need to find new U.S. senators that will back us up. If I were to be speaking to black people specifically, what I would say is that you can't let them see you sweat. I won my race by 90 votes. It was the closest primary in the state of Texas for the state house. And it was black people that pushed me over. It was young people that pushed me over. I am only here because of them. And so you've got to believe that every single vote will count. I don't see that hate in the next generation. They are my hope, they are the future, and I'm praying that they can get us on track because the current generation is doing everything that they can to keep us off track. Now we're gonna keep that mood moving forward with a conversation here of our own. So joining us here today are some of the most influential people out the next generation, out there making waves. First, we have co-founder of Freedom March NYC, Nala Dari, joining us in studio. 
Come on up. Good to have you here. Hey. How you doing? How you doing? Good. Tired. Tomorrow's Juneteenth. Just been organizing and excited and happy to be here with you all. Out there doing the work. I see it. I see it. So also joining us by video is recording artist Keanu Lede and rapper G Herbo. Thanks for joining us, y'all. Hi, guys. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Ken, I want to throw this to you. Um, just so in the segment that we just saw, right, uh, we saw the representative say that she won her race by 90 votes, which, I mean, it's so slim. And it shows really the urgency here, right? And, and as she said, you know, a lot of those votes definitely, she says, come from, you know, young black voters, right? And that urgency that I heard in her voice is something that I saw from you also last year when you said something that I don't think we often hear musicians say, right, that voting is more important than music right now. What made you put it out there like that? I mean, I really feel that so deeply. Music inspires change. And to make change, we have to take action. So music could inform us, music could be a timestamp, but the action that we need to take includes something like voting. Um, and I just thought, you know, it's always more important than singing a song. Did, did you have anybody looking at you saying that and say, wait, really? Please sing for me. Why, why are you getting political <laughs> on me? Yeah, of course. But I've always been a very political person. I stand up for what I believe in, and that's that. Mm -hmm. I dig that. So I want to go to you next, Nyla. I mean, you, it's been, at this point, it's been a little bit over a year, right, since you decided, you know what, right after the murder of George Floyd, you really need to get out and get out into the streets, right, on the front lines. And since then, I mean, I don't want to say we've seen justice, but we've seen some kind of accountability, perhaps, right? And perhaps we've seen some progress. But as we just saw in the segment, you know, we've also seen, you know, in, in almost every state, there's some kind of attempt right now to make it harder to vote, right? And we know these, these attempts to make it more difficult to vote, these affect black people, these affect brown people, these affect the poor, right? These affect the very people who you were out there really making sure that their voices would be able to heard. So, I mean, how do you, when, when you're watching things and you, you've seen the progress that's being made and you see the attempt to roll that back, how do you avoid from falling into that feeling where, man, it, are we actually gonna make it? Um, I just, uh, understanding that it's not a race, it's a marathon and Oftentimes we'll feel like we're taking two steps forward and then one step back, but just keep pushing and keep working. So something that we do at Freedom March NYC is we may not have as many people, we may not have as much resources, but out organize the enemy. And I believe that's what they were doing in Georgia and the reason why Georgia turned blue and why Biden is president and not Donald Trump. So just out organizing. It sucks when you're working and you don't get the results that you want, but you just keep pushing. And that's something that we do and encourage is to keep pushing. Mm. Do you ever have conversations with, you know, fellow organizers where, you know, at some point you have to start feeling tired and just feeling discouraged? How do you push through that? Well, first of all, you can't do your best work if you don't bring your best self forward. Mm. So we always push taking care of yourself, self-care. If you need a moment, if you have to check out to do that, because you can't just be down and out on the front lines. You know, right. we need to be energized and ready to keep it moving. So whenever mm. you need to check out, you need to take some time to take care of yourself, do that. That sounds to me like you, you're talking about a topic that I feel like is perfect to pose to G Herbo, right? Um, I mean, over the course of your career, especially recently, I've seen, you know, just the development and, and a lot of the things you've been talking about, right? And especially, you know, talking about PTSD. How did you decide, you know what, this is my lane. This is something I'm going to talk about. Because this is something that people weren't familiar with you talking about from the very early days of your career, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's more so about, you know, like Trey said a little earlier, it's just about having knowledge, you know what I'm saying, and understanding the platform that you have and the way to use it. I'm able to just speak my truth, talk about the things that I've been through and the things that important to me to help, you know, to get back, you know. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's like a link. I hear it, I hear it. So, so look, I mean, one, one thing that, that we've, you know, definitely been seeing recently is that politicians are getting younger and younger, right? And I think all three of you have something in common in that you are, you know, the young brokers of, of really this next generation, right? And so, but 
in that same lane, you're also seeing the older generations having to kind of take your lead and listen to you. So I want to throw this to you. How, how does it feel to be out there and realizing that there, there are people who are older than you looking to you for leadership? I feel honored. I always, res oh, I always respect my ancestors and those who came before me and those who are willing to take me under their wing and drop some gems. Hmm. I also believe that, you know, we're next up. It's our time. I'm a part of a organization called Next 50, which focuses on electing young people in all 50 states and getting more young people in office. And I don't just want to push to have a seat at the table. I want to, you know, be the table, have young people all around the table and not just one voice. Kiana, you look like you wanted to say something. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's only fair that older people make space for younger people because it is going to be our future and one day our present. Got you, got you. And Her Herbal, I, heard, I definitely heard you saying something. I mean, you, we, we just heard from a second ago um, from Trey the Truth, right? And, you know, y'all you, you, are kind of next up, right? We need people like Trey, you know what I'm saying, who, who, who reach out, you know what I'm saying, to the, to the younger generation for them to use, you know what I'm saying, that they influence the platform because a lot of times, you know, kids, and I was one of those kids that just thought I could do everything and wouldn't really listen to somebody who I looked up to in a way, you know what I'm saying? So for the older generation to reach back and use us as uh, as vessels, you know what I'm saying, it's always the, the great thing to do, I feel like, and train one of those guys who just always on the front line to start commend him on everything he do when any problem, he don't mind get on the plane or whatever. And anyway, you know what I'm saying, help out. He do that. And he looked to to us, to the younger generation, to use our platform in any way possible. Even if we don't have the knowledge, he don't mind giving the knowledge of something that we may learn or may want to learn to do. It's important for sure. So with that being said, Nala, Kiana, G. Herbo, we thank you for joining us and appreciate all the work you're doing. Round of applause for everybody, please. <laughs>so we're going to keep that energy going and bring it up our next performance. So y'all know them well since they're ATL locals, but in terms of the voting, they've also been extremely vocal. So it's all welcome Earth Gang. Check check. How y'all doing tonight? Y'all good? Y'all good? What's up? What's up? Talk to me now. We go by the name of Earth Gang. We for Zone 4. This track right is called Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah. Talk to me now, speak, speak loud and clear. This track is called American Horror here. Story. American. Yeah. Our story. Go like this. Our, okay. Our story. Talk to me now, speak loud and clear. Where would I fly if I was not here? American Horror Story. Our story. Set. 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 Set me free. Set me free. Set, set, set me free. free. <laughs> set okay. Once upon a time across the far and wide, blue abyss, the first people known to earth thrived. Then one day a ship docked with evil intentions that would change the course of the world and shape our lives. Stuck over here like 400 years Stayed iced out through the pain in my tears Ice in my veins, ice in my ears Wrecking my brain, how can I deal? Kids on the block, they getting killed When will it stop? When will it end? I mean for real, real, real Really for real, real, real Granddaddy, granddaddy was po First black man in my family with dough Oh, oh I raise everybody up from the flow Oh, oh Living a generational curse Coco No, they can't with me Say I can't with me what about the police come in my crib and shoot me up? Like part enough, just think about rent. Could have bought my freedom, all the money I spent. Ooh. Ain't that some sh Ooh. I mean, for real, all this money we got and we still can't up flint. Ooh. Don't make it wrong, I would pull up to Lennox to floss on the... Yeah, yeah. But I hate seeing my people get shot up, it just don't make sense. Yeah, yeah. God, I could help you if you stop tripping so much. Baby girl, I can't save you, but I can sure lift you up. Left cheek, right cheek. Make them clap and come together like so icy. Still a little ratchet, still a little boozy, still I take my knee. Cause then the Navy pops in the army, still I take my knee. 
Waiting for somebody in the White House to save us. It ain't likely. Talk to me, yeah. Speak loud and clear. Yeah. Where would I be yeah. if I was not here? Say, say. Horror story. story. Huh? Check. Talk, Talk to me now. Speak loud and clear. Where would I fly if I was not here? Yeah. American. Horror story. Yeah. Say. Say. Set me free. Set me free. Horror story. Set. Set me free. Set me. There goes the neighborhood. Wow, that's crazy. People really used to say that. That's funny, cause now now they coming back to take the hood. Hmm. It's funny how things change. Meanwhile, I'm just trying to get my finances up so I can buy my whole damn block. Bumping it, see a whole damn lot. Make sure you shake the ass to get to lick the lick like you know what it's about. See the table sound so amazing. I rag the brain, get a mic cook out. Tension in the tiki torches. Talking niggas joining forces. Licking up the resources. Brother shine and sister gorgeous. Show the kids how we did it. Better books, better courses. Teacher got to make a living. Test scores more important. How the sister get rewarded. All of my boy heavy pocket. Don't be acting snappers cause you already got it. Tell me y'all both so walk is ironic, you really be in the mirror cause you're not in the down to your brother cause you in the college and you got the perfect collection of rocks, stones, gems, soak up the moon, save with the money, no it ain't true, I don't like preaching, ain't what I do, you be observed, start making moves, but what you heard, I should we choose, earn what we got, build something new, America worst nightmare come true, open this book, hope it break through, this is his verse and drink some juice and pour it and step in some barbecue, say, yeah. talk to me now, speak loud and clear, speak loud and clear, where would I be if I was not here, I was not here, American, our story. Yeah, yeah. Our story. I said, yeah. talk to me now, speak loud and clear. Yeah. Where would I fly if I was not here? American. Our story. Our story. Say, say, set, set me free. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Woo! Woo! Thank you for these uh, TV reporter mics. You know, trying to get this money. <laughs> trying to be where the money resides, you know what I mean? Uh, Earth Gang, no, where you going? We got to talk to you. Bring your ass back up here. Oh. <laughs> y'all, that was dope. We appreciate y'all. One more hand of applause for Earth Gang. We appreciate y'all so much. Uh, gentlemen, I want to ask you this. So American Horror Stories, it talks a lot about the trauma of our people. Mm. Um, I know that's deep. I'm going to let you both kind of talk a little bit about where that came from. Okay. Um, the song was written last summer. Um, so, like, we Earth Gang, global, you know what I'm saying, world renowned. Like, we've been all over the world, been talking to our people, talking to people who look like us and people who don't look like us, sharing the wisdom, sharing the message of one love, and just being in America and not being able to travel and to go places and experience life like we have been three to four years earlier was kind of just weighing on my heart. It was just like, you know, this is just something that I was born into. So, you know, you trying to put that to words, put those feelings to words and kind of cut the story short and just fast forward it from being brought over here to like how we live and the things that we're going through, how we trying to excel and succeed despite what's going on. You know? Indeed, indeed. Listen, we're very excited. We're very fortunate here tonight, y'all. We're gonna have these brothers perform again for us a little bit later in the show. Yeah. Earth Gang, don't go anywhere. We yeah. appreciate y'all. We're gonna see you a little bit later in the show. Y'all at home, stay seated. Don't go anywhere, y'all. We have so much coming up. After the break, our girl revolts. Oh, Angela Yee joins us with a wealth and freedom conversation. I've been waiting on it. I really promise y'all that's why I wore this money green tonight. We have a lot more revolt and vices Juneteenth special on the way. Welcome back to Revolt Black News. It's your girl, Angela Yee, and I had to be here for this very special Juneteenth episode because I didn't want to just be a part of the celebration of our freedom. I had to be part of the call to action for another type of freedom, Black financial freedom. Y'all, we need to stop playing and get the game up with the dollar. So how do we do that? Well, we can look at a number of breakthroughs already achieved and use them as next steps forward. So some examples include elevation of reparations in the form of legislation, like in Evanston, Illinois, small business ownership and entrepreneurship in our communities, closing the pay gap for black workers, strengthening educational support, 
and increase access to financial capital for black home ownership. Now we recognize that progress has been made in a number of these areas, but in order to feel monumental change, we have to come together and make monumental change. So everyone's still got a lot of work to do, but we're extremely hopeful and optimistic when organizations like JP Morgan Chase are actively putting in the work to challenge the black wealth gap for black financial freedom. With their initiative, Advancing Black Pathways, J.P. Morgan Chase is firsthand giving Black business owners the resources, capital they need for their entrepreneurial dreams to thrive. More Black folks are becoming homeowners without racial bias and discriminatory practices, and financial stability is being built. Because when we talk closing the wealth gap, there needs to be a financial base first and foremost. So now joining me to discuss the importance of generational wealth as another pathway to freedom is the head of Advancing Black Pathways from J.P. Morgan Chase, Vina Elliott. Thank you for joining me, Vina. Thanks a lot, Angela. I'm excited to be here. All right, and also with me, our boys, Rashad Bilal and Troy Millings from the Earn Your Leisure podcast. What's up, guys? What's going What's on? on? What's, What's going, going on? on? Glad Thank to be you. in here. Honor. <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining me. So let's get right into it. The economic wealth gap within minority communities, specifically the black community, is something that I know we all know exists and has perpetrated systemic disadvantages. I'd like to start the conversation by discussing the wealth gap and what ways have you all personally experienced its effects? For me personally, before I became a YouTuber, <laughs> I was a financial advisor. And, um, you know, I got to see that firsthand because working with clients, I was a financial advisor for over 12 years, and you see the disparity between the black clients that black financial advisors have, and there's only probably a handful in any, in any firm, and the clients that the white financial advisors have and the conversations that they're having. And you see the difference. You know, you're talking about estate planning with white clients, and they have $10 million, $15 million, $5 million, and you know, the vast majority of black people are struggling day to day just to kind of make ends meet and, you know, working with $100 a month to invest. And you see that firsthand and you realize that um, the reality is that most people don't even fully understand the wealth gap because they're just staying in their area. I saw the effects of the, the wage gap, the wealth gap in education. And so growing up in Westchester, going to school in Westchester, but teaching in the city, you see there's a vast difference. And I like that you said there's up the streets because I used to say that movie Eight Mile was really an indication of how my educational story was. Like I would work 10 miles from where I actually live. And what you notice right away is a lack of resources, right? So the things that I grew up having, even like a school bus, things that I was accustomed to and understanding that my students weren't gonna be privy to, you notice it right away. So resources, access to technology, uh, social economic status, uh, access to job opportunities. This is one of the things that I would preach to our, our youth. Like, what are our kids supposed to do throughout the summer? Whereas when I go back to my hometown, I know that these kids are going to have economic opportunity, whether it be in a summer camp or whether it be at the ro local grocery store. And so you see these things in the eight miles uh, disparity. And it's like, wait, something's happening in here that is not happening there. And my goal was to say, look, I wish that the kids could actually see what life looks like just outside of this bubble that they live in. Because like you said, when you are accustomed to seeing somebody doing something, everybody is on the same level. So you never see anyone try to aspire to get out of that. So definitely in the educational field, you can see the effects of the wealth gap. And I say for myself, when I first started in my financial services career, we sit in a room and they would talk openly around how they manage money and their stock market and their portfolios. And I didn't have a clue because we didn't have that kind of conversation or have that discussion growing up. So I'm very intentional now with my children talking about money and having that discussion around budget, around assets, around investments, and really talking about you know what a what a prospectus looks like because when you have those conversations i do think it really empowers them to understand the money concepts a lot better make it plain and make it part of sort of their livable situation every day but it absolutely is a big difference in the conversations and the what what the context is you think about what you said about having a job and getting a good pension versus passing on an inheritance building wealth creating and creating other employment opportunities for others, starting your own business. Very different dialogue, but I think we can. it happens. It really will make a difference when we start talking about it with each other and sharing 
our vulnerability around how we manage money. Like, I love your shirts that says assets over liabilities. So how many of us are more consumers than investors? And just making it really plain and, pre and giving real life examples so that we can really start to change our behaviors ourselves knowing that there are some systemic challenges, but knowing that part of the change starts with us having a different relationship with money. The Advancing Black Pathways Initiative, can you break down the focus, the focus of this initiative and how this fund is set to make an impact? Well, you set it up perfectly. We're focused on the things that we believe have systemically held back and reduced the opportunities for wealth building in this country. We focus on financial health and wealth creation. That's about that knowledge and sharing those best practices around money management and behaviors. But also we focus on business growth and entrepreneurship, which is the biggest catalyst for building wealth and growing jobs in this country. And we wanna make sure that our black owned businesses have an opportunity to scale, grow and employ others. And then we also want to connect those opportunities for careers and skills about building our workforce, but also supporting our young people as they go through college and get their first or second job, being able to have a livable wage. You talked about closing that, that wage gap, having resources that actually allow you to work and build your wealth and build assets is important. And having that job that pays a livable wage makes a difference. And then you're only as strong as your community. So we want to be anchors in our instant that anchor institute in the community and help those communities develop and grow. I grew up in a really tough neighborhood where you probably would accelerate past it and wonder who lives in that community. Well, I grew up in that neighborhood, so I don't accelerate past it or try to forget about it. I want to make sure that we reach back and make sure that those communities have the same opportunities and set of services and quality of life as other communities that we know have better access. I do want to reflect on why we're all here today. We're here to commemorate Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day. In retrospect of all that we discussed today in regards to financial freedom, some of the questions that I'm left with are, are we really free? How can we collectively move forward towards modern day freedom? And what does that look like to you? We want to be free. And so I think freedom starts mentally first and saying, you know, claiming it. So I, I, being unapologetic, like this Christmas, we bought only from black owned businesses for all of our Christmas presents. And every time I found a great company, I shared it with all of my friends because I wanted all of us to, to start to walk the talk around wanting to invest back in our communities and letting our dollar circulate. And then also identifying companies. If I did have to buy from majority company, well, what's their policy? What are their strategies to support the black community? Did they make an announcement and commit to doing things differently from a racial equity perspective? And if they didn't, why do I, why, why am I buying services or, or goods from them? So really taking that financial myself and then making sure that I pay it for by taking actions and walking the talk. Bye, Rashad and Troy. Thank you so much for joining. We truly appreciate everyone for doing all that you do to help the black community toward a stronger path for economic success and empowerment. Also, we of course appreciate your time and we encourage everyone to visit the link at the bottom of the screen to learn more about Advancing Black Pathways. As for Earn Your Leisure, you can go to earnyourleisure.com to learn more and find out where to listen to their podcast. All right, up next, my girl Ebony moderates an important conversation on voter suppression and what we can do to not suppress our own vote. Stick around, much more of this Juneteenth special episode of Revolt Black News on the way. I wanna to talk to you brothers about the fact that we are all elated happy to see Juneteenth now celebrated as a federally recognized national holiday, no doubt. How did this become so mainstream? I want to start with you, Rodney. Why do you think this is propelled into the mainstream conversation? Um, I think that our government threw us a bone. Mm. I think that they were so afraid of all the things we were actually fighting for that they were like, what can we do that's not going to disrupt what we got going on? Too crazy, but also kind of pacify the ask mm. of that community. Mm. And so they gave us Juneteenth. I appreciate it. I like the extra holiday for sure. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's what we really were fighting and asking for. Yeah. What do you think about that, Doug? I mean, and this, this is one of those things that's almost difficult to say, but where, where I grew up, um, Juneteenth wasn't something you learned about where did you in grow school. Up? I... San Bernardino, California. Cat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, this is, this is something, it's, it's, a, it's a regional thing, I think, which I think actually speaks to the beauty and the diversity, right, of the black experience is that that's not always a conversation we have. Now, should it be? Absolutely, right? But I mean, just as the brother was saying, I think there are things that people really have been asking for for quite some time, 
I mean, a day off, you know, a day off to go vote. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, the, the, there are a lot of things that a lot of people have been asking for, you know, changes, the systematic changes that could be made. And then, you know, can we say definitively, oh, this they're just throwing a bone. It's hard to say that definitively. But does it feel like that? It's hard to deny it. The timing does feel suspicious. Right. You know, we have been talking about. Uh, reparations. Mm -hmm. I, I just got back from Tulsa. And if you've not been, I encourage you to go. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the story of black prosperity in Greenwood District, Tulsa. Beautiful. Um, we've been talking about uh, the George Floyd Act, Justice and Policing. Talks about ending chokeholds. Talks about um, ending no-knock warrants. Talks about uh, changing the standard of, of force for law enforcement to use deadly force. Qualified immunity. Qualified immunity. Right. Thank you, Dex. So there's some other things in queue that we're asking for. Mm -hmm. and I, I personally want to make it clear tonight that while I think there's some good things about this federal holiday, don't get the shit twisted. <laughs> right? Amen. Right? Right. It, it does not eradicate these right. other demands that doesn't that mean that, that have. doesn't mean that it's done correct that doesn't mean that it's done. correct that. now in terms of business and in media i want to start with you on this dex sure. do you think that white media corporations do you think that they are sincere in this moment is this performance allyship or frankly does it matter as long as the ends justify the means you talk about the black squares, is that what you're asking me about? <laughs> I might be asking about them black squares that went up on instagram look look i i think this is what people have to keep in mind, right? Um, the, the, it, it's, is it a, to abuse the term, right, a black and white, a binary of this is exploitative or this is actually substantive, mm -hmm. right? It's hard to say, right? We're all, once again, talking about capital here. We're talking about the system in which we live. So it's hard to really draw a line. I think it's gradation. However, the fact that corporations, companies, even individuals, even, you know, influencers, right, have felt compelled to say something. And then, when they get called out for it, when people feel like, actually, the walk doesn't match the talk. Mm. And when people say it, you can't get your feelings hurt right. because that's the situation we're in right now. So I think, I think these corporations, I think you know, companies, I think individuals, right, celebrities need to be aware that it's open season in the sense that we're all able now to speak back to the power, right? And that right. you may, Get your feelings hurt. And if you get your feelings hurt because somebody says, actually, you put up this black square, I haven't seen you do anything that actually matches that. Don't come crying. Just say, OK, well, what can I do? That, what can I do better? And I think we're at that stage right now. Yeah, a stage of accountability. Mm. I appreciate that. I want to ask you this, Rodney. We know Congress, again, Juneteenth federal holiday is a good thing. Do you think that that is a direct result of the social justice movement in entirety, meaning when people were marching last summer and throughout the fall for the murder of Brother George Floyd. Is that how we even got to even this point of a federal Juneteenth holiday? Listen, Derek Chauvin would be just getting off of work right now if we were not out there in those streets. I, right I, genuinely, I genuinely feel that. Mm. Um, I wonder, just because sometimes I'm a bit pessimistic, you know, if people had to go to work, would we have been in the streets? Mm. I, I don't oh, know. I because if we weren't in quarantine. Right, if we weren't in quarantine in the pandemic, you know, I, I think right. that that the moment in time in which you know George Floyd was was murdered was just the timing couldn't have. I hate to even put it I like this. I know what you mean. Yeah. It could not have been more opportune. Oppor the timing couldn't have been yes exactly. for the sake of the movement. Yes, so I, I think you. that people become preoccupied with their lives, their work, their their survival, their survival. You know what I mean? And yeah. and for the first time ever, there was nothing to preoccupy white guilt. Ooh. They had to look in the mirror. And I think there, was also, no, there was no sports. There were no movie theaters like that. weren't open. That they had to face their own truth and reality. And we were already at a stage where we were having to face as a country, frankly, as, as a planet, the already the inequities that were already there. We were already seeing at that point how, you know, COVID-19, how the pandemic was hurting people who were in those parts of society that were already disproportionately, you know, already disproportionately harmed by that. And yes. we were already learning that they were already feeling that. Right. And so, so many things happen at the same time, not to mention, you know, just how ghastly it was. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, but this isn't the first body that we've seen be, be killed by police on camera. Right. At we've all. seen Philando Castile be murdered in front of his daughter. We've mm -hmm. seen Alton Sterling. We saw Eric Garner. So why George Floyd? And I, I really think it's because we were in a moment of complete pause in our community. 
I, I concur. Um, and as somebody who's covered these cases, unfortunately, for the, the bulk of my career, whether it was as a criminal defense lawyer or as a journalist, I thought that was fascinating too, Rodney Index. Like, we've seen this. I mean, shit, we can go back to Sean Bell. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen it, right? But all of a sudden it took, it took a seeing, and I'm just gonna be real honest because I'm with family. It seemed like it took a seeing of a black man who was in the most subordinate, sub, subordinate um, docile positioning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Asking for his mother. Begging mm -hmm. for his mother. Right. Um, in cuffs at some point. Mm -hmm. It had to be the most subordinate view it, viewpoint of black maleness in order for the world to recognize this is a tragedy. If it took that, it took that. Here we are. Juneteenth is a federal holiday. That's a good thing. We've got a lot more to go. Mm. We're going to pick this conversation up, gentlemen. Y'all know what it is in a minute. Brothers, I appreciate you. And I appreciate you. your insights. We appreciate y'all. All right, listen, we're going to keep this celebration going. We're going to come back and we're going to have yet another incredible performance by my brothers from Earth Gang. Stay with us. This next track is called Go Ahead Remix. With Brittany Howe from Alabama Shakes. Woo! America the Brutalizer. Taking out her pain on us, but who knows why? Probably cause we fly. Cause we can work magic with a wink of an eye. When I dance, sparks fly, now watch me God. Fuck, Nama no minds. For Nama no cons. The beautiful ones, a sign of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To laugh is a threat, to breathe is a crime. I'm born by a God, was forced in the fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My career soars where black bodies hit the floor. I feel guilt, shame. I could always do some more. Are uh, words enough? Does the storytelling lighten the burden up? Marching and fist pumping. Generation on fire, got the whole city burning. We will not be denied. You ain't get the memo that we ain't to be with. Fighters return, defying the words of coroners. Statues will fall, ancestors watching, enjoying us. Reset the balance, my tongue callous from school and Alice talking racist wax. Living in her wonderland, bubble bubbling up, damn. You searching for the problem, yeah. shout it, that's oh, it. Oh, oh, say, can you see? see. see. Them guns, guns aimed at me. Oh, oh say, can you see? see. Them guns aimed at me. Oh, say, can you see? Them guns aimed at me. Oh, say, can you see? Them guns aimed at me. Whoa. Slave blood, king's blood, mothership beamed up. Everything we dreamed of is finally us. Damaged goods from your average hood. Well, I'd rather be overpaid and understood. Only God can judge me and my accomplices. Failure to, to comply. comply. Got my weapon, that's my right. Let's be heavily supplied. I ain't nothing but reflection of the times to the naked eye. Even when I'm asleep, I'm like something to be threatened by. This is for the red dips. Dip the city bus on the city bus. No option for giving up. I'm the sun, sun, so my natural look be sticking up. Sunday brunch to a bun. I ain't eat much, but I listened up. Talk some wisdom. Up. Got a bigger blood, laugh to keep from tearing up. Had to mess the city up, then let them take us serious. Don't pick up your cell, 12 wet you like amphibious. Put us all through hell and tell us God was so mysterious. Especially the ones that are celebrating Juneteenth and products of this here. Catch it, we doing this. Yeah. yeah. All right, y'all. Now listen, don't go anywhere, those of you at home and right here live in person. When we come back, Brother Rodney Rakai, he picks up and he interviews Charles D. King about epitomizing black excellence in entertainment. You don't want to miss it. We've got a lot more of Revolt and Vices Juneteenth special after this. I feel like being a black woman is hard in general, you know, just in a regular world. Being a black woman in the music industry is also incredibly difficult. Black women in this industry, we have to stick together. We have to uplift each other and people have to see us uplifting each other and encouraging each other and supporting each other. I'm singer songwriter Tierra Thomas and you're watching Unbothered. 
I've just always really loved music. Um, as a kid, we used to do beats on the lunch table with a pencil. You know, I always used to be writing raps and stuff in elementary school and middle school. So I asked my dad if he would buy me a guitar. And he bought me a guitar and I started teaching myself how to play. And when I was 12, I said I was going to win a Grammy. And this is, I mean, I could play like two chords on the guitar. So I started putting my raps to guitar. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Uh, and then I started singing with it. This is for my exes. I wrote a song for y'all. And I hope you like it. Once I started really being able to put singing and playing guitar and rapping together was when I really thought like, okay, I'm gonna be an artist. Biggest influence of music that I heard growing up was gospel music. And still to this day, it's like my favorite type of music and Kirk Franklin's my favorite artist. So uh, yeah, I grew up in church. I feel like there's so many different ways to express yourself through music. It makes you feel something and it kind of tells a story that maybe you weren't able to tell yourself. And so that's something that music has always done for me. I'm telling my life story and I'm able to express myself and I'm able to maybe say things that I normally wouldn't say, uh, just, you know, talking to people. It just kind of makes you open up and uh, be free and feel comfortable and share your ideas, like whatever crazy ideas they may be, you know, when I'm in the studio or when I'm performing, it is a very freeing feeling to just get all this energy out, you know, to the world. Just coming from a place where I didn't really know any black girls that sang and played guitar. I ended up listening to a lot of artists like John Mayer and Coldplay and NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. So I think that definitely shaped what type of music I make now because I kind of take little elements of that and like take it into the R&B world with me, you know? So I like to kind of mix genres. So first time I heard myself on the radio actually uh, was when Bad came out. I was in, at, in Indianapolis at the time. I was still living in Indy. I was driving around for weeks, you know, listening to the radio, waiting for the song to come on, and they never played it. So I eventually called the radio station. I was in the car. I was like, yo, like, I'm from here. Play my song, you know? Like, everybody's playing my song. So, uh... I ended up hearing it that week, I think, and um, it was really exciting. I was in the car by myself. I just remember seeing cornfields because, you know, I'm an Indian. I think my first thing that I ever did with Wale was when I was still in college and um, I flew out to go work with them in the studio and I did this song with them called The Cloud that I wrote when I was like 15 and it's about smoking weed. And then the next song after that was, was Bad which is actually a song that I wrote in my college dorm room. I used to take rap songs, like kind of like a little bit ratchet rap songs, and I would play them on the guitar and sing the lyrics instead of rap them. And so I did a cover of a song called Some Cut by, by Trillville. And I always liked that song as a kid. And I started singing it and playing it on guitar. And then I was like, okay, I need to come up with another piece that like kind of ties into the song. So then I just started singing, kind of like freestyling, like, you know, is it bad that I never made love? No, I never did. I was like, that's, I like that, that's dope. So um, I recorded it with my, my friend, um, Kelson, who also helped me produce the song. And we put it on YouTube. I remember that night we listened to the song like a hundred times and we were like, wow, this song is fire. When I first found out Rihanna was on the remix, my heart dropped because I was like, well, first let me say that I love Rihanna. So um, as a fan, you know, I was like, oh no, no, now Rihanna's singing the song. And so that, but that was short lived because when I listened to the song, I was like, wow, she like, she sounds like me. Like she's singing it like me. And like, I wrote this song when I was in my dorm and like, this is what I always wanted to do. And now Rihanna's singing my song. So it, it quickly turned into um, excitement, a lot of excitement. And then when I realized how much more money your song makes when somebody like Rihanna jumps on your song, then I was like, okay, you know, cool. I was really shocked when I won the, both the Grammy and the Oscar. I didn't really have time to process even what was going on. I'm like, okay, what's happening? It just all started from her and I, we were on a FaceTime call and we were talking about just everything that was going on in the world. You know, it, there was the George Floyd, the Breonna Taylor, just, and, and everyone was forced to pay attention to it. You know, for the black and brown community, this has been something that we've been dealing with for years and years and years and years and years. So it was just such a frustrating time. So, you know, we're on the phone talking about this and she's like, I want to write a song about it. And so I remember when we got off the phone, I just felt, I felt relieved because we were able to talk about it and put lyrics down and uh, turn it into a piece of art, you know, how we were 
feeling. Never at any point did I think, um, oh yeah, this song's gonna be nominated for a Grammy or, you know, that's not what we were trying to do. We were just trying to get out what we were feeling. And so it was definitely an honor to even be nominated for the Grammy. And um, I was happy and shocked with that, you know, just being nominated. And uh, messed around and won. I got my Grammy and my Oscar sitting on my coffee table because I don't have anywhere to put them yet. So they're just kind of like, you know, chilling there, like, you know, might be a little paper and crumbs around them. But, you know, uh, I just be looking at them like, wow, what a crazy life in here. Welcome back to Revolt and Vice's Juneteenth special supported by JP Morgan Chase. I am your guy, Rodney Rakai, and I'll be hosting our next segment. Now, if you tune into Revolt Black News on the regular, which you better be doing, fam, there is a weekly segment called Black Excellence in Entertainment. But because today is Juneteenth, we wanted to do things a little bit different and highlight one individual who is epitomizing black excellence in their role in Entertainment Daily. So joining me today is the founder and CEO of Macro, the media company behind projects like Judas and the Black Messiah, Mudbound, Just Mercy, and Ray Raising Dion, to name a few, the list is long, y'all. And we'll get to all the diversity he and his company pioneer. I am pleased to be joined by the brother, Charles D. King. Charles, first and foremost, black man. <laughs> applause. I'm so unaccustomed to like live studio audiences. We've been, we've been sidelined for a year, man. I'm used to Zoom calls. How is your spirit doing today, man? Man, my spirit is doing good, man. Uh, it's just, you know, beautiful day. I wish I were there in the audience there with you. Absolutely. But uh, no, man, it's great. Things are opening up, excited about getting back out there. And uh, I can't wait till I'm sitting in one of those audiences myself. Absolutely. Where you're sitting right now looks real regal. You look real royal. Uh, got the high <laughs> chair and all that. I see you, beloved. So, Charles, when you started Macro to bring black perspectives to filmmaking, you put your career as a talent agent behind where you represented big name black clients. Now, a lot of people would not do that, but you did. Why? Yeah, man, there were several reasons. You know, I had a vision before I went into the talent agency space, before I went into the, the mailroom at William Morris, was to really one day do this. And I knew that part of it was getting inside the belly of the beast, getting the experience, the exposure from being an agent, but also frankly, being an artist advocate from within the walls of you know the largest talent agency in the world. But I knew the real empowerment would, would come from going to the other side, raising capital to actually finance and tell our stories. And so ultimately, it would have been a bigger risk to our community and, and, uh, and a travesty of justice to actually not take that experience to do what I'm doing today. So, you know, yes, there was a, a little bit of leap of faith, but the risk, uh, you know, definitely far as it, it was, was, even though the risk was great, the reward is that much greater. Right, so I would imagine there was a fair amount of doubt there, you know what I mean? And so for you, when you're having a low vibrational moment, how do you overcome that? Because we all go through it, brother. You know what, man, my faith and my family, that's really what's taking me through most of it, man. I just, a lot of belief and conviction and also knowing that uh, the vision for what I'm doing, it, it far exceeds uh, just myself and my family and the country and the company that we're building, but it's a much bigger thing for the culture and for the community. So uh, with all of that, I mean, you just think about our forefathers, you think about our ancestors, you think about the, 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 the trails that were blazed for us to do what we're doing, for you to be on that stage. Yep. For me to be on the Zoom, to have a company where I'm the CEO of financing movies and television. So look, man, I, we, we owe it to our ancestors for us to be brave. And so, yeah, I had to, had to like overcome any small fears I may have had to, to do what I'm doing. Absolutely, absolutely, man. You, you founded the company in 2015, and six years later, you've been killing it. When we see a lot of these films that highlight our, our community, the black excellence, you know, whether people know it or not, Macro is behind a lot of these projects, man. So for you, how important is it to be telling the story on the right side of history and doing it justice? How good does it feel to tell our stories? I mean, I feel very blessed and fortunate to be able to be in the position to do this. But uh, like I said, we've been in a position for years where we haven't been in, able to tell our stories, where it's unfortunately uh, the infrastructure of Hollywood, both the studios, the financiers, uh, the ones that actually control the distribution pipeline have unfortunately not had that background. Uh, they have not come from our community. So uh, to have that experience in the agency space, to know how the whole ecosystem works, I knew I was able to take that experience, put a business plan together in place, you know, with an incredible team, raise capital to actually finance and tell these stories and frankly make sure that 
the filmmakers, the artists that we're working with, that they have not only the experience base to produce and develop, but also the capital behind them to actually execute and tell their stories authentically. Yeah. And, uh, and so hopefully what we're seeing is a body of work on all of all platforms, both film, television, and we're obviously we're merging into other digital content and others where it really truly is reflecting that. And, and, and you'll see that connective tissue over years as we continue to build that body of work. Absolutely. And I kind of underspoke. You, you weren't just an agent, you made partner. And that's, that's, a different, that's a different level. So shout out to you for, for all the success that you had there and then making this, this huge leap of faith. Uh, I want to talk about one of my favorite movies of the last year for sure, Judas and the Black Messiah, obviously a polarizing film. Uh, it told a very important story about Chairman Fred Hampton. And then the reception that it received was very positive. It did, it did well during award season. We saw Daniel Kaluuya win the Oscar. So talk to us about the experience of being such an important role in one of the most important films that we've seen in a very long time. Yeah, no, it was, it was incredible. I mean, the, the big thing behind it was, this is a story about a leader, a revolutionary, Chairman Fred Hampton, who at 21 years old was unfortunately assassinated uh, by our government. And it's a story that, to be frank with you, I didn't know that much about it. I knew a fair amount about the Black Panther Party, but I didn't know as much about the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party. And I certainly did not know the depths and the, the, the visionary leadership and the, the level that Chairman Fred Hampton was, 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 was going to. And the fact that this 21-year-old man had that power at 21 and, and our, you had government forces, but you know, the galvanized behind quelling his voice. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, it was a story that needed to be told. One, so that our youth of today could know the power of their voice. If he was able to galvanize communities, create the Rainbow Coalition when he was 21, can you just think about the power of our youth today and the power of social media and all the tools and education they have behind themselves? So in order to tell that story, you know, the other great thing within this too was, was the partnership behind it. I mean, this was macro partnering with my brother Ryan, Ryan Kugler and his company Proximity and Shaka King, who was the, was the filmmaker. Yep. So here it was, this was a historical event where the three producers of a Academy Award nominated movie were all black. And that made history. We didn't frankly realize that until I, I think may have been a week or two before we actually got the nomination. And frankly, if anything, it shows, just like you're, you're saying it reflect this, this show, touches on black excellence, well, it shows the excellence within our community and the excellence of the storytelling uh, and the way that we can, you know, be doing that at the highest levels. And so, you know, that partnership of, of people coming together to tell the story of a revolutionary and to then also have the community embrace it, have, you know, you know, you know, Panthers, black, black Panther members, have Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. and his family be a part of that process with us and have them be proud of it. Uh, and then to, you know, icing on the cake was to get critical acclaim. So all around, it was just a beautiful experience. And hopefully what we'll see is this will absolutely, we, we may have been the first of, uh, you know, like an all black producer group to get a, you know, Academy Award nomination. And we certainly won't be the last. And then the next time, hopefully, they'll actually, you know, go home with the big, with the big trophy. Absolutely. This time we came away with two, with two Oscars, which really two out of six, it was pretty good. Yeah. That's like LeBron's rate for winning championships, right? I think that you're on a, you're on a good path right there. Uh, you really did the film <laughs> justice, and I think that you opened up doors for more stories about the Panthers to be told down the line, which uh, I'm excited about the, the opportunity for that because there's so many others that we need to visit and, and we need to, uh, to highlight. So uh, when it comes to the younger community and the next generation of filmmakers, you know, what do you hope they're able to take away from your art and knowledge beyond the big screen? Yeah, several things. One just follow your passion, follow your passion. There isn't anything in life you can't, you can't achieve. If you can imagine, you can envision it. If you put a plan together, if you get your education, you work hard towards it, understand in, in the filmmaking and entertainment business, understand the creative elements of, of the industry, but also understand the business side as well. Absolutely. And, and I would say build relationships, build the relationships with the, with the group of cohorts, your filmmakers, the other producers and artists that are coming up with you, because you guys are going to, together are gonna be the ones who are gonna make the difference. And, and just really, the other thing I would say is, tell the stories that you're passionate about. Don't just follow the marketplace and think about, you know, what's worked before and, and, and what you may hear people are looking for. Make the stories you wanna tell. Make the stories that you feel like, literally, if you don't make this art, if you don't tell that story, 
that you literally, there won't be breath in your body. And usually, you know, when people create from that, uh, that's when the real magic happens. Yeah. And, uh, and so I would just say, make sure you do your work, persevere, and you will absolutely get that moment of opportunity. And when the door swings open, kick it and run right through it and make sure you kept, you leave it open and, and, and let a, another 10 people through with you and make sure they then do the same. And then, you know, then we'll, you know, we'll continue down this path and there'll be real change. And uh, stories will be told, you know, uh, the images that we see will be more reflective of our world and of our community. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we'll see both better images, but we'll also see more economic empowerment in our communities at the same time. Got it. Good brother Charles D. King, we know you are a very busy man with amazing Wi-Fi service. We really appreciate your time, man, and we wish you all the luck as you continue carving a path for our people in a very, very important space. Salute to you. I, I cannot thank you enough, my brother. Appreciate you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Keep doing everything you're doing. Love and light. All right. All right. For the Rodney, Dex, want to appreciate y'all. This was amazing. It's so worth every bit of the wait. Y'all, federal holiday, Juneteenth. Let's give it up. Yeah, yeah. The good news is this is not just about Atlanta, although we love Atlanta. This is also about the nation. Let's look at Washington, D.C., where Congress, the United States Senate, has made this a federal holiday, finally. What I want you to know is, to be clear, we can do more than one thing at one time. We will celebrate this very well-earned acknowledgement of our people's emancipation and liberation. Amen, right? And at the same damn time, we will acknowledge our demands around reparations, around the ending of police brutality, and around other efforts of anti-black oppression. What I want y'all to know is when we talk about progress, this is not a path that we have to endure by ourselves. See, this is a path where black lives should truly matter. And all the allies that said so last year show up today to acknowledge the fact that we built this country, America, for free. Talk about it. And finally this, my brothers and sisters and non-binaries, because by the way, shout out, happy pride. Yeah. Hey. Amen. Hey. I want y'all to know this, that we hope that this celebration does not end today, but instead that it inspires each and every one of us to continue to keep inspired to the freedom that pushes forward in more ways than one. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's keep in mind, y'all, that 14 members of Congress voted against the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act. They say mostly for reasons based on the name. But look, we're not going to let that get us down because today marks our Independence Day. So we're gonna celebrate that. But it should be a reminder at the same time for us and hopefully for the rest of America that the 4th of July did not declare independence for any of us, only for people who enslaved us. And as black people have always known in this country, America isn't free until we're all free. From the British to Galveston, that's how it works. Absolutely. And Galveston wasn't that long ago, mm. and yet the idea of our freedom for our people can still at times feel more myth than achievement. Do we appreciate getting an extra holiday this year? You're damn skippy we do. <laughs> Even though frankly it is a little weird that white people also get the day off. But let's not forget what we were really asking for before they decided to give us Juneteenth. Hmm. We were asking for our voting rights to be protected. Yes. We were asking for police reform. There it is. I mean, can a brother get some reparations? Amen. <laughs> Honestly, we do not have control over outside forces. So whatever we do, let's just make sure we continue to do it together to make sure that the entire community advances and ascends forward collectively. Indeed, mm. the collective. Brother Rodney, that's important. Whether the gap was two and a half years ago in Galveston, or whether it was 400 plus years right here in the USA, we have to ask us, what do we want around justice, peace, equality, and most importantly, equity? Now, don't get me wrong, there's more to get. Y'all, we have to achieve in terms of prosperity. Shout out to Tulsa, Greenwood District. I was just there. Shout out to the fact that our people are ones of self-determination and ascension. We have never, right, been a people of complacency. Can I get an amen? Amen. It is. Amen. See, we will keep our feet on the gas and our feet on their 
mother effing next. But in the meantime, our fists, I, you know, I gotta do it, are in the air, in all sincerity, as we celebrate our national holiday, national holiday of Juneteenth. And we relish the fact that lawmakers are finally required to listen. Y'all listen, this has been something we and our brethren and sisters have been saying for months, if not years. Mainstream society can no longer defy the fact that what? Black lives matter. I'll say it one more time. Black lives matter. Think about it. Look, some of y'all know the deal. I'll leave you with this. The queen, sister, Opal Lee. Look her up if you're not familiar. She's a lifelong Juneteenth activist, and she says this, that this holiday must actually be celebrated not just from the 19th, no, 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 from June 19th all the way to July 4th. Why? Mm -hmm. So that today's June 19th special celebrates the accumulation of the fact that there were 15 days from when those 250 enslaved Africans were made free of their emancipation. So y'all, we got 15 more days to go. We start celebrating on June 19th and we go till July 4th. Mm -hmm. Let's keep celebrating, let's keep pushing, let's keep requiring more. I wanna thank everybody involved tonight, I truly do. From JP Morgan Chase to Vice, the gathering spot. Yeah. Shout out to the gathering spot. Not to mention all of those of you at home who have tuned in, helped Definitely. support this nation and this network. We want to thank you. We want to show some love for our Revolt fam, Brother Rodney Rakai. Oh, yes, brother. We love and appreciate you. Vice News' Dexter Thomas, we appreciate you. As always, I'm your gracious host, Ebony K. Williams. And hey, listen, hey. we want to give you a final performance of the night because that's what we do here at Revolt. Kirby and D Smoke. Yeah. And the master was the slave. The killer was the victim. And man was God. My nose wide as the red sheet. Red sheet. Lips full, fillers don't feel me. Feel me. Soon as my cousin killers on trial, family gon' pull up, sit in court side. God sent they shade. Singing la la la, don't want no vultures on that side. Yeah, yeah, looking black is the Messiah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got superpowers. Yeah, 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 We got superpowers. Yeah, yeah, and my people cannot forget that. We get so fly without the wings. Without the wings. Baby's childs can see the light and darker things. darker things. Wait, wait, now they see our magic. Probably we imagine days when they can't frown upon our fabric, barb and weave. Yeah, Been dodging yeah. thieves and stolen culture. I believe in poaching vultures. I believe in open ocean trips. No ship I backstroke from one coast to coast like Aquaman. Got mind control over the lava lamp. That's why my pen leak fire. I retire when my father can. Look up to the sky and see me cloud sitting. It's a bird, it's a plane, know this power living. I kicked the rainbow yesterday, it let out sour Skittles. I bet Trayvon up in heaven like these my kind of vittles. Armadillo, armor thick, got bulletproof karma, cause I'm in the scent of all that they accuse me of. Uh, superheroes and sheroes with POs accusing us of moving kilos. Still always moving love. Super good. So
Super Power.